Rise up as we pray together. Father, we do thank you for this session. Thank you for what we have learned already. We're asking, Lord, that you open our spiritual eyes to see and our heart to understand. And we pray that you break every yoke in Jesus' name. Amen. Destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Set your people free. Amen. Draw the curtain and give us the revelation we ought to have so that the devil or the demons will not be hiding behind anything anywhere and uh, to be cheating us and uh, touching our lives. Give us the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, that this session now will be tremendous. I hope now in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your people. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, you can see. And we're coming to Second Samuel. And I'm reading verses 1 and 2. Second Samuel chapter 21. Looking at verses 1 and 2 then. There was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites and the children of Israel had sworn unto them and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Those are the two verses we are looking at together. As we look at these verses, the verses reveal an aspect of God's compassion which is not well understood. Many people do not understand. Many people do not see through. Many people do not appreciate the compassion of the Lord in making some revelations to us. Most people do not know. In fact, sometimes people do not want to know the truth of divine revelation. Here, there was a famine. And as the family was there, if it's in a personal life, in a family life, all the people want, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, so that this problem and this challenge will vanish. But you know, just praying and praying without knowing the cause of the problem, the reason for the problem, and without knowing the root of the problem, is like wanting medical treatment without medical examination. You get to the nurse, you get to the doctor, I'm sick. Okay, let me test you, let me know what is really up. No, 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 I just want prescription. I want treatment. It doesn't work that way. And that is the way some people treat prayer. They pray in the dark. They intercede in the dark. They counsel in the dark. They probe in the dark. And they try to get solution in the dark. Because they do not know exactly what the problem is. And you know, God did not volunteer to give the revelation until David went to the Lord. Look at this in verse 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And tell me what follows. David inquired of the Lord. Stop there for a moment. What if David did not inquire of the Lord? After three years, it will continue. Four years of famine. Seven years of famine. Many years of famine. If he had not asked, without this revelation, the famine would continue. The calamity would continue. The suffering will continue. The sickness will continue. The mysterious affliction. We don't understand this. We're the covenant people of God. How could this be happening? And we'll just be wondering. We'll just get confused. And we'll say, why is this happening in my life? Why is this happening in my family? We must ask the Lord. It's unfortunate they waited three years before they even went to ask 
the Lord. Look at uh, chapter 8, chapter 8 of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 1. Famines are not limited to one year, two years, three years, or whatever number of years. It depends on when you go to the Lord. There might be a challenge in your life right now, a challenge in your family right now, and then you have not even asked the Lord. You're just saying, I'm praying, I'm praying. You're praying, but what's the root of the problem? Let's look at chapter 8 and verse 1. Then speak Elisha. Unto the woman whose son he had raised, he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord has called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land. How many years? Seven years. So you understand? If David had not gone to ask the Lord, that thing would have continued. And you're thinking about some challenges you might have in your family. You might, you're thinking about some challenges somebody might have brought to you. And just pray for me. Just pray for me. What's the root of the problem? What's the cause of the problem? What's the situation? What brought this? And there is no evidence that they have the revelation as to what caused the problem. And it seems might not just be limited to seven years. It might just go on and on. Look at chapter 74, Psalm 74. And I'm reading from verse 9. Psalm 74, and we're reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, we see not our signs. What does that mean? We see not our miracles. We see not the manifestation of the power. We see not the wonders and the signs, and there is no more, there is no more any prophet, neither is there any among us or any that knoweth how long. You see that? It's been going on now for three years and four years and five years and seven years, and now we don't even know how long it's going to continue. You must ask, you must find out. What's the root of the problem? What's the cause of the problem? Psalm 89. I'm reading from verse 46. Psalm 89. And I'm reading here from verse 46. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? They have not been able to find out the revelation. And the reason why these things were happening to them at the time they wrote this psalm, and now they are saying, we're wondering how long this will continue. We're wondering how long the calamity will continue. We're wondering how long the suffering, the disaster will continue. And he said in that verse 46, how long, Lord, will thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. Look up here for a moment. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I have 70 years to live. I have 80 years to live. And this problem is consuming all my resources. 10 years have passed. When you take that away from 70 years or 80 years, what remains? God, how long will this continue? Remember how short my life is. And this is going on and on. And that's the problem we get to when there is a challenge. There's, a, there's an affliction. There's a demonic attack, and then all those attacks going on, we don't know the root cause, and we do not know the solution. And then we're just praying and praying and praying. Why don't you find out? Why don't you stop that medication that doesn't have behind it a medical exam and say, I want to know the root of the problem, the cause of the problem. It is only there you'll be able to find the right solution. Well, you've got the point. The point is this. Whenever there's any challenge, whenever there's any problem, whenever there's any disaster, any calamity, any affliction, instead of just praying, praying, a brother pray for me, sister pray for me, pastor pray for me, so and so pray for me, let's know the root of the problem. Tonight I'm talking to you on the root and the remedy for mysterious afflictions. The root and the remedy for mysterious afflictions. Tell me what you are writing down. 
the root and the remedy for mysterious affliction. There are three points we are talking about. Point number one, divine record and remembrance of man's foolishness and sinful zeal. Divine record and remembrance of man's foolishness and sinful zeal. Point number two, diverse reaping and retribution with famine and severe suffering. Diverse, various kinds of reaping and retribution with famine and severe suffering. Point number three, decisive repentance and recovery. Thank God tonight you recover. I said tonight is a night of recovery. Decisive repentance and recovery through faith or steadfast submission. Decisive repentance and recovery through faith or steadfast submission. Point number one. Divine record and remembrance of man's foolishness and sinful zeal. Let's come back to Second Samuel chapter 21. Second Samuel chapter 21, reading from verse 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul, for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. Look up here for a moment. If you check up all through the lifetime of Saul, you will not find a record of this event that took place. He went to the Gibeonites and he destroyed a number of them, a lot of them. But you know, he was king. He had authority. And because of that, he did that. Everything was covered up. It appeared secret. Appeared hidden. Appeared covered up. It was like no record anywhere about the action on earth. Because it was king. He sinned with impunity. Because he was king, he claimed immunity. You've heard that word before. You've seen them in the newspapers. Because this person has this position, he has immunity. Because that person has this authority, he has immunity. And because of the stature of this person in society, what can we say? Even if you knew that something was going on, immunity, and therefore the sin was impunity. And Saul silenced the prophets and the preachers. Nobody talked about it. The writers, nobody wrote about it so that nobody will put it on record. But you see this now, God saw it. No one could conceal it from his view. The sinner Saul had gone to face his own doom and damnation before God, before the Almighty, and before the uncountable host in the great beyond. And now the nation, think about this now, how is it at this time now? The nation left behind, they were now the people that suffered. As you study the Old Testament, you're going to discover something. You'll discover if a murder had taken place, and then the murderer escaped, and there was somebody that knew about that murder, and eventually they, made, they told them, you'll make diligent inquisition. If they made the inquisition and discovered so and so knew about it, but he did not report it. In the Old Testament, there will be a severe judgment on them. If something had happened in a community, like you saw a dead body in a community, they will go to that community, they will make diligent inquisition. If the whole of that community, they covered it up, 
the judgment will come upon the whole community. Now, you know, there were people that massacred those Gibeonites. There were people that destroyed those Gibeonites at destruction of Saul. Therefore, some people knew about it. They knew those Gibeonites were being destroyed. They were being killed. Nobody said anything. And God kept quiet as if he didn't know. But it went on record. And now, at this time now, while Saul was facing eternal judgment in hell, because we're told in other parts of the Bible, he died this way, and God took him away because of his sin. The people here, because God had made diligent inquisition, these people knew, these people knew, these people knew, and they said nothing about it, a famine now descended upon the nation. And look at this, what God is saying. Look at Psalm 50. Psalm 50. I'm reading here from verse 21. Psalm 50. And we're reading from verse 21. The record and the remembrance. God may not talk. He may not say anything the first day that thing happened. He may not talk a few days, a few weeks, a few months, even a few years after the thing happened. But he's God. He's God. Look at this. Psalm 50. I'm reading from verse 21. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. That's God talking. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. You see, at the time when God will strike, people might even have forgotten that anything like that happened. And the person who did that thing might go out of that community. But that thing has happened. And God has record about it. And God brings it to remembrance. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We're looking at it from verse 11. Ecclesiastes 8. Reading from verse 11. It says in verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Because of that, therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You know the understanding? God will not see this. Because we did something last week and nothing happened. If God knew that this one is wrong, let him come and strike us and knock us. No, God doesn't take accounts on Saturday. He doesn't judge at the end of our week. He has his own timetable. And he has his own time when he will visit the iniquity upon the people. But because human beings are ignorant. And it says because an offense, a sentence has not been passed immediately. They think nothing will ever happen. Something is going to happen. If there's oppression. If there's a sin, if there's evil, even though you might have thought we buried it, we're forgotten it, it is not on record, and nobody is writing about this, it comes to remembrance and uh, it's on record before the Lord. Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, we're looking at verse 14. Isaiah chapter 42, tell me the verse. Verse 14, I have long time holding my peace. Look at that. This is the almighty God. He said, you think I didn't know? You think I didn't see? You think I didn't put it on record? I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a traveling woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs. Farming now, I'll dry up their vegetables. I'll dry up their crops. I'll dry up their herbs. I will make the rivers islands. I will dry up the pools. They have a drought. You see that? God says, I kept quiet for a long time. But so record, and I'm going to bring it to remembrance. Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah chapter 14, and I'm reading from verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 14, 
We're looking at here from verse 10. It says, Thus says the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore, does the Lord not accept them? He will, what's the next word there? Now remember. It's a record. He will now remember. You see many people, they think, you know, we've been doing it and doing it and nothing ever happens and nothing will ever happen. You don't understand God. You see what Saul had done? He killed all those uh, Gibeonites and it's like it's covered up. It's like the thing will never come on record. It's like there's no remembrance of this. It's like we're free. It's like there's no judgment anymore. It's like God has changed. He used to be very firm and severe against sin. But you know, so many people have committed so many sins that God cannot, you know, be visiting those iniquities anymore. He says, but now in verse 10, now remember the iniquity and visit their sins. Then we come to Osea chapter 8. Osea chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 12 and verse 13. Osea chapter 8. I'm reading here from verse 12. It says in verse 12, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Sound doctrine. Great revelation. And great interpretation of the word of God unto the people. God said, I've written to them the great things of my law. But you know what? They counted that as a strange thing. Who preaches that this modern time? Who emphasizes that this new age? It was like a new thing to them. A strange thing to them. Verse 13. They sacrifice flesh for sacrifices of my offerings and eat it. But the Lord accepted them not. Then, tell me the next thing there. Now will he remember their iniquity. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. Not physically, but all the oppressions of Egypt that they escaped. He said, the time has come. And they're going to go through that kind of Egyptian bondage and Egyptian uh, oppression again because of the sins they were committing and they thought God does not see this one. God is not going to take care of this one. And God has forgotten his divine administration. No, he has not forgotten. It's on record. And then we have remembrance. Come back to Second Samuel chapter 21. Second Samuel chapter 21. And I'm reading here from verse 1. Second Samuel chapter 21. Reading from verse 1. It tells us, Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnants of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them. Tell me. In his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Look up here for a moment. When a king was raised up in the land of Israel, they gave their reason. They said, Give us a king that he will go before us against the enemies, the Philistines in particular. And that's why when Saul became a king, the Philistines came up, and then he couldn't defeat them, and then David came, and David, by the grace of God, after he gave his testimony, the servant was watching over the flock of his father, and a lion came, and he said, I took him, and I slew him, and then a bear also came, and I took him by the beard, and smote him, 
And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. And so we understand the enemies he was to conquer, he was to conquer those Philistines. He left the enemies alone. He was now pursuing something cheap, defenseless people, weak people. The people that were drawers of water and they were hewers of wood among the children of Israel. The people that were servants and slaves that they had no way to defend themselves and to get cheap popularity that now I'm doing something in a zeal for Judah, in a zeal for Israel, you know, went after them. And, you know, nobody spoke about it. You couldn't talk to Saul about whatever he was doing. And so he felt everything was over. And now three years famine. Let's look at that zeal to start with. There are some people that are zealous about non-essentials, about things that do not take consecration, and the things that do not take any effort, and the things that do not amount to anything, and the things that God has not commanded, and the things that is not going to be rewarded in heaven, and they're just zealous and zealous about it. Hey, come on here. Look at what's important. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and be zealous about that. And then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And be zealous about that. Without holiness, someone shall see the Lord. And be zealous about that. And then there are young people to teach and the other people to disciple and everything we're to do. Be zealous about that. But they are zealous about things of no consequence. And that's what happened. That's the thing the Lord wants us to avoid. That we look at things that are essential and things that are important. And then you redirect your zeal in the right direction. I'm looking at 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 16. 2 Kings chapter 10. We're looking at verse 16. And he said, this is Jehu now. Come with me. And see my zeal for the Lord. And so they made him ride in his chariot. Come and see my zeal for the Lord. As we go on, look at verse 31. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Look at that. Zealous on this. Come and see my zeal for the Lord. And yet he took no heed in walking according to the word of the Lord. We're looking at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Sinful zeal. Worthless zeal. Unprofitable zeal. A kind of zeal that will not be rewarded by the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 2. It says in verse 2, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That's not what God has required. That's not what God demands. That's not what God wants done. And it says they have a zeal but not according to knowledge, but for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, it tells us, but to Israel, he says, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Zealous on unessentials. Zealous on something worthless. Something unrewardable. Wasting their lives. And wasting their energy. And so wasting the privilege he had to be king. And the authority he had he could have used in the right direction. He wasted that in a sinful zeal. And now he's gone. And the nation was still there. And this now was happening to the nation. Why? Ecclesiastes chapter 3. 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 15. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And here, we're reading from verse 15. Ecclesiastes, tell me your chapter. And tell me the verse. Verse 15, you need to underline this one. That which has been is now. That which has been. Ah, this one has taken a long time. It's been there all the time. And nobody investigated it. But now it is now. And that which is to be has already been. And God, tell me. And God, say it aloud. Requires that which is past. Saul had done it. It's like it's past. The Gibeonites have suffered. It's like it's forgotten. Many of them have been killed. It's like there's no justice. And now God requires that which is past. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two. Diverse reaping and retribution with farming and severe suffering. We're coming back to Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 21. And I'm reading from verse 1. Second Samuel chapter 21. Verse 1. Diverse reaping and retribution with farming and severe suffering. Verse 1, it says, Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house. Tell me the next word. Tell me that next word. Because, just one word, give me the word. Because, because he slew the Gibeonites. Think about that for a moment. Think about that famine. The famine, not only on one tribe. The famine on all the 12 tribes of Israel. Think about that. That thing could have been avoided. If Saul had not done what he did. If he had not killed and massacred all those Gibeonites that God now was visiting the whole nation because of what he did and because of the Israelites that knew about it and he didn't speak out. And it was like they gave a quiet consent to what was done. And because of that quiet agreement, nobody is raising any voice that this is not right. That this should not be done because of that quiet consent, God counted them guilty. Saul and his bloody house perpetrated all that, but the people that remained, that didn't talk about it, and didn't show any sign of disagreement, the judgment now came. And everything is hinged on that single word, because... As you look at that through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, and you search for that word because, 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 you understand something. That a lot of sicknesses in our lives we can avoid, even without praying and fasting. But because if this did not happen, this does not happen. You know, anytime we use that word because, it is because of this, by reason of this, on account of this, due to this event and action, this is what is now following. As long as this happens, this must also happen. That's the word because. In as much as this has happened, this will follow. Since that, therefore, this. And once you can cut off that because... And you remove that root cause or because all the other things that should follow will not follow. Calamity will not stay in your life. Amen. Disaster will not stay in your life. Amen. We need our eyes to be opened and understand that these afflictions, many afflictions, they are avoidable. 
suffering, avoidable. Unnecessary um, calamity, avoidable. Unnecessary famine, avoidable. And once you underline that word, because, because, I'll say no, I'm not going to allow that first thing to happen that will generate and produce this other one. Thank God tonight you are free. Amen. I'm talking to somebody there. I said tonight you are free. Amen. Look at this. We are going to, we're going to follow now the word. What word are we looking for? Okay, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, and I'm reading here from verse 17. Genesis chapter 12, we're reading from verse 17. And the Lord, this is not Satan, and it's not, uh, you know, it is not anything demonic. This is the Almighty God Himself. Look at this. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. Tell me the next word there. Because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. Welcome to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. And I'm reading verse 18. Genesis chapter 20 verse 18. For the Lord had first closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. Tell me the next word. Because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. If that other thing did not happen, Abimelech's house, do a king, will not know about this calamity, about this disease, and about this affliction that came upon them. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And we're reading from verse 35. Exodus chapter 32. We're looking at verse 35. Are you there? I said, have you opened the verse? And the Lord plagued the people tell me the word because they made the calf which Aaron made they could have avoided all the deaths in the wilderness they could have avoided all the afflictions that came on them they could have avoided all the sorrow all the suffering and all the bereavement that came to them but because of that calf it says God plagued them we're coming to Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. And I'm reading from verse 22. Numbers chapter 22, verse 22. And God's anger was kindled. Why? Because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his horse. And his two servants were with him and what's the you know the calamity on those servants because they are following the wrong man they're following a man that was not walking in the steps of righteousness in the way of god and because he went the lord had told him don't go then he went to god again this boy have come again should i go and it says because he went that's why all those things happened to him eventually he died he died with the people that were fighting against the people of God because, because, because he, what he could have avoided, he didn't avoid. You see, many things happening in life, if you don't stand back and relax, don't pray yet. Don't begin to shout yet. Don't begin to bind this one and bind that one and say, why is this sin here? Why is this suffering here? Why is this calamity here? Ah, now I discover because, because, because. And once I take care of that because, very easy. Then you go back to God. You will pray and God will answer your prayer. You ask and you depend upon the promises of God and God will say yes every time because you've taken care of that root cause which is because. I'm coming to uh, now Joshua, Joshua chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 12. Joshua chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 12. It says, therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. What's the next word? Because they were accursed, neither will I be with you anymore, except she destroy their accursed sin from among you. Up, 
sanctify the people and say sanctify yourselves against tomorrow for thus says the lord god of israel there is an accursed sin in the midst of the o israel thou canst not stand before thine enemies until 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 thou ta ye take away the accursed sin from among you you see that if, if people do not understand all this that there is a because there is a reason why this calamity is happening they just go on you know, i'm going on a prayer retreat i'm going on a fasting retreat i'm going to the mountain somewhere i'm going to a valley somewhere i'm going to pray and thrash out this problem the sea cannot continue and they pray in the dark and they pray in ignorance and they probe in uh, ignorance and they're looking for dream they're looking for revelation and it's very simple and god is saying because of this that's the root of the problem that's the cause of the problem and you take care of that because and your problems are solved and your family comes alive straight and then something good continues to happen. Everything you've been looking for for five years, for seven years, the gate is open, the door is open, everything is now all right. Because you've taken care of the root cause, which is because, because, because. And that's what David should have understood about that famine. I'm coming to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 9. 1 Kings chapter 11, and we're looking at a verse, tell me, verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. What? Solomon. Solomon, his beloved king, Solomon, that he appeared unto twice, and he said, I'm going to make you richer than anybody that ever lived. I'm going to give you greater wisdom than anybody that ever lived. And now it says, and God was angry with Solomon. What's the next word here? Because his heart was turned from the Lord, God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Because, because, what happened after that now? Look at verse 14. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's siege in Edom. God stirred up enmity against him war began because he had gone away from the lord second chronicles chapter 20 second chronicles chapter 20 i'm reading here from verse 37 you know sometimes it's a business that a believer is doing then something turns the other direction and you know the money ought to be coming forth from there nothing is coming and then you put all your capital there nothing comes out and this one and that one and then we begin we're sending prayer requests brother pray for me things are tough and prayer warriors there please remember me things are hard and then we, if you find anybody that knows how to pray we'll send text message or email please remember me in prayer i'm going through a lot business i put everything up got all my gratuity everything i put in there it's gone down the drain look at this we're looking at second chronicles chapter 20 verse 37 then eliza the son of dodava of marisha prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying what's the next word you see that if we can just check up this in our lives and understand it says because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah the Lord has broken thy works and the sheaves were broken that they were not able to go to Tashish because 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 some 107 verse 17 some 107 some 107 we're looking at verse 17 107 verse 17 this is important to open your bible are you there what's the first word there fools what's the next word because of their transgression fools because of their transgression how can i be in a church like this and i'm suffering like this and i'm going through this and i'm going through that 
Why don't you just relax? Why don't you just sit back and find out when you first knew the Lord, the first two years, do you remember how God was blessing you? Before you open your mouth and say, God, look at what I need, the blessings will flow. Don't you remember the first job you got? Did you write any application? Somebody just told you they're looking for this over there and then you got there and then they spoke to you a few minutes and then they said, are you ready to start today? And then the things you did at that, that time, things will just flow. Even things you didn't have the experience of doing. You know, you just did it like this and everything came out. But now, five years, ten years after, fifteen years after, the doors are closed. The situation is hard. Times are hard. I'm knocking at this door. It's not opening. I'm trying this and nothing is working. And it appears that everywhere I go, things are against me. Look at this again. Psalm 107 verse 17. It says, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities. Tell me the last two words. They are afflicted. They are afflicted. I pray that the Lord will open your eyes and you'll see the reason for the affliction. And when you see that reason for the affliction, everything will vanish away in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 13. Isaiah chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 13. Isaiah chapter 5. Reading from verse 13. Look at what it says here. It says, Therefore, my people are gone into captivity the next word because they have no knowledge they don't have revelation they don't have insight there's nobody to interpret the events happening in their lives and there's nobody to tell them the reason for this pressure and the reason for this calamity and the reason for this affliction and the reason for this and that happening in their lives it says therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst then it tells us in Hosea, Hosea chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 6 Hosea chapter 4, reading from verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed. Why? Because of the lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. You know, sometimes somebody is likely to say, oh, that's Old Testament. They think our God has changed. And they think that the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. They say that was the time of the law. And this one now, this is the time of grace. You think so? That God's administration has changed. That God's justice has changed. That God's attributes have changed. We're coming to Matthew, New Testament, chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 29. Matthew chapter 23. And we're reading from verse 29. Look at this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What's the next word? Because. New Testament. Woe to you. Can you think of Jesus Christ, loving Savior, the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and full of truth, raining curses on people, want you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you built the tombs of the prophets and garnished the sepulchres of the prophets. Look at verse 33. It says, ye serpents and ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell we're coming to luke chapter one luke chapter one i'm reading from verse 20 luke chapter one here we're looking at verse 20 luke chapter one verse 20 the story here is this this man zacharias had been praying with elizabeth the wife they were righteous they were pure 
they were holy. As we talk about the Christian experiences that we're having now, back then, even though Christ had not come and John the Baptist had not even been conceived, they were living the life that was pleasing unto God. And God loved them and he brought their prayers into memorial and sent an angel unto Zechariah and said, Zechariah, good news. Something is going to happen. Your wife is going to have a baby. Somebody there, say amen. amen. And then instead of, even if you didn't understand, are you not a priest? Are you not a minister? Don't you remember Abraham and Sarah? Are you as old as Abraham and Sarah? If you don't understand, why don't you shut your mouth and keep quiet? An angel came all the way from heaven. It doesn't happen like this every day. It doesn't happen like this every season. And he said, I brought good news for you. You're going to have a child. I'm going to even give you the name of that child. And then uh, Zachariah said, but how can this be? Look at me. Look at how old I am. You know, sometimes it's good to be quiet. Because, you know, when you are quiet, we don't know whether you are ignorant or you are wise. Because your quietness, your silence will make us look at you like a man of faith. And you're a man of faith. A woman of faith. You'll be a woman of faith. But look at this. Now, Luke chapter 1, verse 20. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. What's the next word? Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And he became dumb. And for those nine months, because of one word, because, why did you keep quiet? Here is what the Lord is saying. Here is revelation coming to you. And people have not learned this lesson. That I'll walk carefully. I'll walk prayerfully. I will soak in the word of God. I will sink in the word of God. And then leave it in the hands of God to fulfill the word the way he wants and the time he wants. We're coming to chapter 19 of Luke. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 43. Luke chapter 19. Reading from verse 43. We're chasing the word because, because. It tells us here. In Luke chapter 19 verse 43, For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and lay thee even down to the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Tell me the next word. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The Lord sent unto them the Messiah, Christ, to turn the situation around and to bring refreshing unto them. But because they did not understand their time and the time of their visitation, it passed them by. Your time will not pass you by. Amen. The goodness of God will not pass you by. Amen. And your time of miracle will not pass you by. But you see, the people that, if they're looking one direction, that's the way they're always looking. They're dejected, they're sad, they're sorrowful. The door is open now. Revelation is coming to them. And they're still looking in that same direction. And instead of cheering up and saying, praise the Lord, I'm making a discovery today. This revelation will benefit my life today. I said, this revelation will benefit my life today. It will benefit your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts of the Apostles now. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 23. Acts chapter 12 verse 23. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him. Tell me the next word. Because. You see, New Testament. is New Testament now. We're even now, we're after the cross. Now we are after Pentecost. And so many years after Pentecost. And this man, a king, immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost. 
We're coming to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 20. Romans chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 20. It says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. When we hear the word of God, when the revelation of the word comes to us, and when the promises of God come to us, and then there is unbelief, it says, because of unbelief, they were broken off. It says, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God not spared not, the natural branches take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The word because it's everywhere. Old Testament, New Testament, it tells us if we're going to have the blessings of the Lord, we must understand that this root cause of calamity, the root cause of affliction, and the root cause of demonic attacks, we cut it from the root. And we say, now I understand the devil will not cheat you anymore. And demons will not afflict you anymore. And all those things that appear to be afflicting your life, they will not be in your life anymore in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Look at this. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. I pray you'll not believe a lie. Amen. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So then, as we have gone through all this, what are we gathering from this? What are we learning from this? What conclusion are we making from all these? Many problems, sicknesses, afflictions, even so-called natural disasters are avoidable. They are avoidable. It is not like God has said, whether you like it or not, this affliction must come. Whether you like it or not, the sickness must come to you. They tell you or they tell us, maybe they're telling all of us, when you reach a particular age, this must happen. So don't be surprised. Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. There is a because, there is a reason, there is a root cause. And the remedy comes when you look at the root and dig it up and say, I root this one out. Every plant which the heavenly father has not planted in your life will be rooted out in Jesus name yeah. and once they are rooted out thank God I see somebody there you are free yeah. you are free in Jesus name yeah. you know this you need to know this that a saint in Babylon understand Babylon is dirty Babylon is devilish Babylon is demonic Babylon is infested with uh, serpents and everything, but a saint in Babylon is safer than a backslider in Zion. Zion is supposed to be a beautiful place, a great place, a good place, a protected place, but a sinner in Zion, a sinner, a backslider in Zion will be worse off than a saint in Babylon. Anywhere you are living, you cut away that because because they did this because they did that this calamity came and then you look at the root of that thing you say i will be a saint whether i'm in rome i'm in babylon or i'm in jerusalem i'm in anywhere i'll be a saint there are things that will not happen to somebody who is standing on the word of God every moment of his life. But if somebody is a sinner or a backslider, even if you are living in Zion, 
Even if we're living in Jerusalem, some things will be happening because of those things that are planted there that were not uprooted. But thank God tonight, they are uprooted in Jesus' name. And you'll be free in Jesus' name. And so, I want you to get that sentence again. A saint in Babylon is safer than a backslider in Zion. If we're saved and righteous, if we're sanctified and holy, if we're prayerful and watchful, if we're steadfast in labor, yokes and curses will be destroyed. Afflictions will be taken away. Demonic attacks will be avoided. They are avoidable in our lives in Jesus' name. You underline all those references of the scriptures. You notice those, that word because you learn from them and then you are free. Somebody there, I am, I am free. We'll come to point number three now. Decisive repentance and recovery through faith with steadfast submission. Decisive repentance and recovery through faith and steadfast submission. Let us come to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I'm reading from verses 13 and 14. Chapter 7, verse 13. Are you there? If I shut up heaven, who is talking here? God. You see, there are people, whatever is happening, they attribute everything to Satan. They are backsliding, and therefore the curse of the broken law is following after them. Or they say it's Satan. Or they are uh, they're careless, or something negative is happening. They say it's uh, somebody's family somewhere. It says, Almighty God says, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, this is Almighty God Himself is saying, if there is a root cause, if there is something there that shouldn't be there, and because of that, I send the pestilence. When you see that, look at verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Look up here for a moment. There is a famine. It's taking three years now. And now we want to find solution to that famine. And there is a God, G-A-D, a prophet. And there is a Nathan, is not dead yet in the land. And these prophets are still in connection, good connection with God. And we're not going to Nathan or going to God. We're going to the Gibeonites who are still traditional. And who are still in their old ways. That the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had not influenced a judge. And they still had the bitterness in their heart and the hatred against Saul. And we're going to them and we're saying, now the whole nation is in this problem. What do you counsel that we do? David, I thought that if you even know better than that, you know better than the Gibeonites. Are you not the Swiss psalmist of Israel? I don't you understand, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Can't you go to God and then claim your covenant right? Why go to those people? And here is God now talking to Solomon, his son. He said, if I shut up heaven, you have famine, whether it is for two years or three years or seven years, if my people who are called by my name, somebody there, I'm called by the name of the Lord. If they will turn from their wicked ways and seek my face and call upon God, he says, I will hear. He will hear your prayer tonight. And we don't need to go to this or go to that. And we're looking for a solution. The solution is in that Bible in your hand. And that solution will translate from the Bible and get your life tonight in Jesus' name. I'm coming to Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33. And I'm reading here from verse 14, Job chapter 33, and we're reading from verse 14. 
For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he opened their ears, he opened their ears, the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction. That he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. He chastened also with pain upon his bed sickness. And the multitude of his bones was trumping so that his life abhorreth bread. He loses appetite. And his soul didn't he meet. His flesh is consumed away. That it cannot be seen. And his bones that were not seen stick out. You know, it's emaciated. It's lost weight. It's like a skeleton now. And look at this condition. It's almost like this one is irreparable. This one is irredeemable. It's like the man is going, the woman is going. Yea, his soul draws near unto the grave. And his life to the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious. That is, if somebody comes that can give us the right interpretation and show us, my friend, look at this, because, look at this, because, look at this, because, look at this, because, and then you open your mouth, what? So that's the reason why all these things are happening to me. If there is an interpreter, a messenger, and one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him and saith, deliver him from going down to the pit. Deliverance has come today. I have found a ransom. Look at verse 25. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him. He shall see his face with joy, and he will rain down to man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. You will see the light again. You see, that's the solution. That's the solution. We just understand this is the root of the problem. And this is the tragedy that is happening. And because we know that, we approach that. And thank God, a remedy will come. A remedy has come tonight. We're looking at Job chapter 36. Job chapter 36. And I'm reading from verse 5. In Job chapter 36 verse 5, it says, Behold, God is mighty. And despiseth not any. He is mighty, his strength and wisdom. He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but will the kings are they on the throne? Yea, he does establish them forever, and they are exalted. And if they be bound in fetters, look at that, if they be bound in fetters and beholding in the courts of affliction then he shows them their work and their transgressions that they have exceeded he said look at your life instead of just fasting and fasting and fasting praying and praying and praying look at the root cause and look at the problem he shows them their transgressions that they have gone beyond he openeth also their ear to discipline and commandeth that they return from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, return from iniquity, return from transgression, return from evil. If they obey and serve him, tell me what will follow. They shall spend their days in prosperity and tell me the rest. The years in pleasures. That's what they will do tonight. We're coming to Psalm 107. 
Psalm 107, from verse 17 to verse 20. It says in Psalm 107, verse 17, fools because of their transgressions, transgression, and because of their iniquities afflicted, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. And it draw near unto the gates of death. You know, when some people, when they get near to the gates of death, they say, well, I don't think anything will happen again. Because, you know, these demons, even my dreams now, this I cannot understand. And then the thoughts that are coming to my mind, I cannot understand. Shake that off. New life is coming. Amen. Power is coming. Amen. And the promises of God be yes and amen in your life. And you're not saying, well, look at me, I am here. Look at me, I am here. If somebody will carry me to such, they're not going to carry you to anywhere. Right there, the name of Jesus is mighty. And the righteous runneth into it and is safe in Jesus' name. It says in verse 19, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he saveth them out of their distresses. And when is your time? I say, when is your time? Is now he sent his word and healed them and delivered them. Tell me from their destructions. We're coming to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, I'm reading here from verse 12. Joel chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 12. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Look at what he's telling us here. It says, therefore now, also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me, how? With all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. And then after that, you need to understand now, after you've done that, you come to the Lord, you've been finding out because, 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 ah, now I see. Now I see the secret. And I see the reason why these calamities were there, and then you get rid of them. Sin, get out of my life. Backsliding, get out of my life. Backbiting, get out of my life. I thought somebody there would say, Amen. Amen. And then you, you come after you have said everything bye-bye to all those uh, children and all those uh, products of the devil. Then you turn to God, repentance and faith in the Lord. And say, Lord, I stand on the promises that cannot fail. And because those promises that cannot fail, you're standing on them. Whatever may be assailing, you will prevail. And then you say, in the name of Jesus, it doesn't take one hour. Everything will come out straight. Look at what will follow. Look at what will follow. Look at verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer. Are you there? The Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil. Farming will come to an end. And you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you reproach among the heathen. Look at this. But I will remove far off from you. I will remove far off from you. No, look at what follows there. I will remove far from you the northern army. You know, it's like, you know, we cannot overcome. They are powerful. They are mighty. And we're in trouble. They have come. Have they come to your area? They are coming to that, they are coming to that area. He removed the northern army from you. Yeah. And will drive him into the land barren and desolate. And with his face toward the east sea. And his inner part towards the uttermost sea. And his thing shall come up. And his ill savor shall come up. Because he has done great things. If you repent, verse 21, fear not, O land. Fear not, O land. Brother there, fear not. 
Sister there, fear not. Be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Look at, look at verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. The canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent. You see that? It was the Lord that sent that. The calamity, the affliction. He said, the army which I sent among you. And now in verse 26, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall not be ashamed. And my people shall not be ashamed. Repentance, precious repentance. Decisive repentance. Self-sacrificing repentance is what God demands today. You know, look up here for a moment. It's easier to sacrifice souls, sons. Anybody can do that. You don't have a relationship with those sons of soul. Anybody, you know, you don't have pity over them. Anybody can go and take Saul's sons and then go and sacrifice Saul's son. That one is easier. But to sacrifice your pride, to sacrifice all the things you were looking at that brought you into trouble and say this, leave all those sons of Saul alone and leave all those people. I want to sacrifice my sinful desires and lay that on the altar. I want to sacrifice my secret sins. I want to sacrifice my self-will. I want to sacrifice my profit and my gain. I want to sacrifice my fears. I abandon everything. I lay them on the altar. I face God, absolutely surrendered unto God and say, God, I come. My heart, my soul, everything I have belongs to you all that pride and sacrifice and I come to you now laying everything upon the altar the fire will come yeah. that's why Elijah came to the people and he said he didn't go and take you know souls and sons and all that he said how long hold you between two opinions if God be God serve him he bail then serve him and he could not answer him a word and then he repaired the altar of the Lord repaired the altar of the Lord tonight and then they poured the water and then he said God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob let these people know that I'm your prophet you sent me and turn their hearts back to you he, he had not even finished the prayer the fire fell the fire will fall tonight and consume every sacrifice and consume every attack and every affliction there because because we know what has caused the problem now and we approach that thing and then we come to God we say Lord nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I cling rock of ages clear for me let me hide myself in thee and let the water and the blood from your even side which flowed be of sin the double cure and take away the sin and take away the consequence and then as you go out through that door today you're free I'm talking to somebody that say you're free tonight. What are you get up and tell the Lord and say, Lord, here is the day, the day of decision. Here is the day, the day of revival. Here is the day, the day of breakthrough. Here is the day, the day when all those calamities, all those afflictions, all those things will vanish away today. I lay everything upon the altar. What am I suffering? What am I suffering? And what am I going through? Why am I going through this? Why am I going through that? Because, because because, because, get rid of those things and then power will come from on high today. Anointing will come from on high today. You tell the Lord, any kind of bondage there, any kind of affliction there, any yoke there that ought to be broken, say, Lord, I come, Lord, I come, Lord, I come. And then you lay, sacrifice the pride. Leave all those sons of a soul alone and say, Lord, I know that's not my problem. That's not my problem. The problem is the pride and the problem is the backsliding and the problem is the secret sin and the problem is this, is that. Oh Lord, I lay it now on the altar and I come to you and then the fire of the Holy Ghost will come and the power of the Almighty will come upon your life. Everything shaken will be shaken. The poverty will go away. The affliction will will go away. The calamity will go away. The demonic attacks will go away. The affliction will go away. And the long-standing sicknesses tonight will be rolled away. No sickness can stand there when 
that we mention the name of Jesus. By his stripes I am healed. By his stripes I'm delivered. By his stripes I am set free. You tell the Lord tonight. All that famine will vanish away. All that calamity will vanish away. All that affliction will vanish away. All those sicknesses will vanish away. All the bad luck will vanish away. All the curse will vanish away. All the yokes will vanish away. All those things at my back, all those things in my head, all those things on my knees, all the arthritis, all the things I cannot bend, and then I'm emaciated now. It's like I don't know what I'm going to do again. There's something to do tonight. The name of Jesus will break every yoke. The name of Jesus will destroy every work of the devil. That's why he came. He came so that we'll be free. Tonight is that night of freedom. Tonight is that night of liberty. Tonight is that night of redemption. Tonight is that night of signs and wonders in your life. He's there. He's very close to you like this. Closer than your hand. He's very close to you. Closer than your breath. And as to say, Jesus, Jesus, you're my Lord. Jesus, you're my Savior. Jesus, you're my Redeemer. Is there tonight. Touch him. He's going to take those things away. Touch him. He's going to take those things away. Touch him. Tonight, he'll turn everything around. Tonight, he'll take you out of that dungeon. Tonight, he'll take you out of that prison. He'll take you out of that captivity. He will take you out of that oppression because tonight is the night of your freedom. All those things hanging on your body, shake them off. All those things tormenting your life, shake them off. All those things that they tell me, shake them up. All those things they said, this one is because that one is this, and that one is that, and that one doesn't have any name, that one doesn't have the shake it off, shake it off. I say, Lord, I am free tonight. In the name of the Lord, you are free. By the anointing that breaks the yoke, you are free. And by the promises of God that cannot fail, you are free. Your family is free. Your wife is free. Your husband is free. Those children, they are free. Shake it off. Every plant that the Heavenly Father has not planted in your body, in your business, in your family, everything will be uprooted tonight. Shake up those things. Tonight is the night of my freedom. Tonight is the night of total redemption. Tonight is the night that every yoke will be broken. Tonight is the night that I'm free. You're free. If the sun shall make you free, set you free, you're free indeed, 100% free. You're free in your head. You're free in your body. You're free in your spirit. You're free in your soul. Free and free indeed. Whatever is tying down your finance, you're free. Tying down your family, you're free. Tying down your progress, you're free. Tying down your prospects. You're free. Call upon him. Hold on to those promises and don't let it go. That thing that is trying to destroy your body, destroy your life, you shake it off tonight. It sets you free. He breaks every yoke. He breaks every fetter. Don't accept those things anymore. Never again. Don't say that's the way it has always been. Since we got married, that's the way it has always been. Never. Since I came out of school, that's how it has always been. Never. And since I started living in that community, that's how it has always been. Never. You reject that tonight. And say, Lord, here I stand. I stand on victory ground. Calvary must take effect today in your life. The blood that flowed from his vein must take effect in your life tonight. The piercing of his side, the piercing of his hand, and the piercing of his feet must take effect in your life tonight. Those tribes, those tribes, those tribes they laid on Jesus must take effect in your life tonight. Pentecost must take effect in your life tonight. The power of the Holy Ghost. The power that subdues every work of the enemy must take effect in your life tonight. It was a new song in your mouth. Joy in your soul. Victory in your soul. Free 
free, free indeed. I don't sing those old songs anymore. I don't think old thoughts anymore. I don't wear that old look anymore. I don't visit those old places anymore. I don't accept those old afflictions anymore. I don't accept those old dreams anymore. No. No. A thousand times, no. Now things are new. Now things are new. You're on the right side of Calvary. You're on the resurrection side of the cross. He rose again. He rose triumphantly. And he comes to do wonders in your life tonight. That resurrection power. Walk in your life tonight. I will say yes to the Lord. I will say no to the devil. I will say no to the affliction. I will say no to those negative things. And you say no to those evil plans. And you say no to those wrong thoughts. I will say no to those negative events. And you say no to those negative happenings. I will say yes Lord, yes Lord, yes Lord, yes Lord. I welcome your blessing. I welcome the miracle. I welcome the deliverance. I welcome the power. I welcome the authority. I welcome what you're doing tonight in my life. A new day. A new life. A new blessing. A new inheritance. The fulfilling of the promises that cannot fail. It's done. It cannot fail. It's done. It's mighty and powerful. It's done. That's what they said he will do. It's done it. He said I will restore. He said I will heal. He said I will deliver. He said I will set free. He said I would uphold you. For the right hand of my righteousness. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? No, no, no. the day of his power and the day of his promise and the day of his goodness in Jesus name we pray the amen that will seal the answer even before the final prayer The Lord has opened your eyes. Those eyes will not be blind to the truth anymore. You have seen your victory. You have seen your will. You have seen the revelation. And you have seen the deliverance. The recovery is now for you. The past is gone. A new day has started today. What are you there? Father in Jesus name. We well, thank you because you have revealed to us today all those things that have happened in the past and it seemed like mystery and it seemed like where did this one come from? You have revealed to us today the root cause because you said because, because, because and your people in faithfulness. They are taking care of all that because all that now is behind us. I pray Lord that any backsliding I pray, Lord, that enemies did forgive in Jesus' name. A new life from tonight. A new perspective from tonight. A new direction from tonight. And the grace and the strength to walk in righteousness with you. Grant everyone in Jesus' name. Now every evil plant. That the almighty God has not planted in the life of his sister, in the life of a brother, a mother, a father, a child, a wife, a husband. Lord, right now, I uproot it in Jesus' name. Every curse you are cancelled. 
every yoke you are broken those long-standing sicknesses i command that sickness come out in jesus name and all the people that are they're just getting sick and sick and sick and it's like they're getting emaciated and it's like people are saying it's going from bad to worse lord in the name of the lord i reverse it tonight in jesus name life to come into you strength to come into you healing to come into you the supernatural to take over your life are you demons of affliction are you demons of calamity and demons of accident or whatever you are i command you come out in jesus name and i pray lord that everything that has impeded the progress of anyone here a brother a sister a leader a pastor an overseer the wife of an overseer anybody i pray oh lord root them out in jesus name grant everyone the freedom the liberty the fulfillment of your promise the sick is healed already in jesus name the oppressed delivered already in jesus name confirm your word in every life your promise in every life and lord as your people go home a new song a new strength a new energy a new vision a new focus a new blessing everything they have lost restore into their lives confirm your blessing in every life i thank you because i know you have answered in jesus name we pray